Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marco Polinen. Uh, I'm Associate uh, Dean of Program Development and a um, professor in the Department of Mathematics. Um, before we get started, um, a land acknowledgement uh, would be appropriate. Um, as we gather tonight, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. Um, now, uh, on behalf of Trent University, it is my honor uh, to welcome you to the inaugural David Poole uh, Lecture in Mathematics. Uh, tonight is all uh, thanks to the generosity uh, of Dr. Uh, David Poole, uh, established by Trent University Professor Emeritus uh, David Poole, who is the former chair of uh, Trent's Department of Mathematics. He's a uh, former uh, associate uh, dean of, of teaching and learning. Uh, this annual uh, lecture series will feature talks about mathematics uh, and mathematics education. Uh, on behalf of Trent University uh, and the Peterborough community, um, thank you, Dr. Poole, uh, for your vision and dedication and for the legacy you have left our university. Thank you. Um, so uh, I now welcome uh, Dr. Poole to the stage to give a few brief remarks. This one. And I'm going to hold the microphone rather than risk it falling on the floor. Uh, welcome uh, from me as well. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you're all looking forward to Jane's talk as much as I am. Um, I know it's going to be a, a fascinating talk. Uh, so, uh, so welcome. Good to see so many people here. Standing room only from the looks of it. Um, many, many years ago, when I was just beginning my career here at Trent, um, I wasn't quite sure what direction that career was going to take. And I was having some, some misgivings, um, some doubts about you know, uh, how things were going to evolve. Uh, and I was attending a conference, uh, and I expressed uh, some of those misgivings to another mathematician who was slightly older than me. Um, and uh, his, his response was, was interesting. Uh, he said, don't worry. Mathematics is a very big tent, and there's room inside for everyone who wants to be there. And I, I was very um, relieved <laughs> by that uh, comment, and I've remembered it ever since. Um, and I'll, I'll remember it uh, forever. Uh, in a sense, I hope that this lecture series can be a version of that big tent uh, and bring people together uh, from the Trent community, faculty, students, anyone really, uh, and people from the local community, teachers, their students, uh, anyone really uh, from the community uh, who's interested in uh, mathematics, uh, learning more about mathematics, hearing interesting talks about mathematics, uh, that's the tent that I hope that this lecture series can be. Uh, in a sense, the genesis for this lecture series goes back 25 years, almost to the day. Because 25 years ago, I started writing a textbook, uh, a textbook on linear algebra, to be specific. Um, and I, I wasn't really sure what I was doing, um, but I, I, I worked away on it. Uh, and when it saw the light of day, it turns out, other people seem to like it too and adopted it for their courses um, and it's still being used. Uh, and so in a very real sense, uh, that book is the reason that I'm standing here and that we are all here today. Um, so there's some people um, that I, I, I really need to thank uh, who, who, who made this possible. Uh, first of all, Trent University for providing the, the, the climate, the environment um, in which these kinds of innovations can take place. Uh, the math department in particular uh, for being a very supportive department, terrific colleagues, and a department that, as long as I can remember, uh, has allowed people to experiment and do different, sometimes even quirky things in their courses, uh, and I think that's all to the good. Um, most importantly, though, I need to thank my family, um, because 25 years ago when I started writing that book, um, most nights after supper, I would retreat to what I euphemistically called my scenic subterranean study, uh, a windowless room in the basement. Uh, and, and that's where I would work. And so I thank my, my, my three kids, Katie, Laura, and Rob, 
um, for uh, allowing me to do that, although I'm not entirely sure at that stage if, if they were completely aware of what I was doing. Um, but most importantly, my partner, Marg, who's here tonight, uh, for the love and support she's given me over the years, uh, I can honestly say without her, uh, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here, this series of talks wouldn't be happening. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, on to the talk, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce someone who's quite familiar with Jane's work, uh, having taught her uh, when she was an undergraduate, and I think he's, he's, he's followed her career uh, since. Kenzo Abdella, a uh, longtime member of the math department, and himself a Trent alum. Kenzo? Thank you, Dr. Poole. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here tonight uh, to introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, who is Trent graduate, a Trent graduate, one of Canada's leading applied mathematician, and a widely respected researcher on the spread and persistence of infectious disease. Dr. Jane Heffernan uh, is a professor at uh, York University, where she is also director of the Center for Disease Modeling and the Tier 2 Research uh, Chair. Dr. Heffernan is an award-winning public health researcher whose focus of late has been dedicated almost exclusively to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Her COVID modeling work has covered a wide range of topics, including how mutant strains may trigger further waves, how the virus transmits in long-term care facilities, and the importance of PPE. Jane is involved in international immunization and public health networks, serving as a board of director with both the International Society of Mathematical Biology, it's all listed here, <laughs> uh, and Canadian Applied and Industrial Mathematical Society. On behalf of Trent University uh, and the Department of Mathematics, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Heffernan to our campus. It is an honor to have her here with us tonight to share her work and ideas. Across Canada, around the globe, Trent University alumni are making significant contributions uh, to their professions and communities, and quite a few are here today. Uh, and every year, Trent University Alumni Association presents the Distinguished Alumni Award to the deserving alumni based on their achievement and leadership in business industry, profession, or public life as they strive to create a better world. This year, the university has chosen Dr. Heffernan as one of the recipients of this prestigious award. Before, Dex before Dr. Heffernan, Jane, um, begins her lecture, I would like to invite Trent alumina and one of the Trent senior development officer, Emily Vasilides, to present Dr. Heffin, uh, Dr. Heffernan with the 2022 Distinguished Alumni Award. <laughs> Without further ado, we present Dr. Jane Heffernan. Thank you everyone for coming. I'd like to especially thank uh, Dr. Poole. I'm very honored to be giving this inaugural lecture of the David Poole Lecture Series. Uh, I also like to thank the math department and Trent University for uh, their recognition. I really, really did enjoy my time as a student here at Trent um, and so did my family members. Um, and so uh, my brother went to Trent, my sister, my husband, his sister. Um, so this really is a family affair and some of my family is here and I'd like to thank them for all of their uh, support over the years as well. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to speak today on uh, COVID-19 work that I've been doing and I'll give a little bit of an introduction to myself and to disease modeling uh, as part of the lecture as well. So um, I've, I've always liked mathematics. Um, and when I was younger, uh, I was always trying to uh, figure out what I could do with math uh, growing up. 
and I was always also interested in healthcare. Um, also, I love to travel, and I'm interested in architecture. And so when I was in high school, I went to my guidance counselor and talked to her about what I could do with mathematics. And uh, apart from teaching, she said I could be a pilot, an architect, uh, or an actuary. She didn't even say engineering, <laughs> so that was funny. Um, and so I decided that I was going to be a teacher, and I was going to go to Trent, to the Con Ed, uh, Trent Queens program. Um, and so I went to Trent, uh, started uh, my undergrad degree in mathematics and computer science, uh, and that's where I first met Dr. Poole and Dr. Blaniak. Um, in while I was at Trent, I was on in, involved in a lot of um, math activities. I was the president of the Math Society, which is now called SEM, but was called Mascot back then. And we had intramural teams called the Pylons. Uh, we, we won Alt Intertube Ultimate Frisbee one year, um, so that was great. Um, and I also got to serve on hiring committees, and I got to hire Dr. Kenzu Abdella uh, as part of that. Um, so we really enjoyed our time. One thing that uh, I will always remember <laughs> Uh, is my fourth year course in mathematical modeling uh, that Dr. Abdella uh, taught. And he used a textbook here called Mathematical Models in Biology. And this is written by Dr. Leah Cachette from U the University of British Columbia. And it was this textbook and this course that changed my life. I really got to see how I could use math to apply to health and biology. And so that's when I decided uh, that I would pursue some uh, higher level studies. Uh, I finished my Bachelor of Education, which makes me a better professor. Um, and I get to do research in healthcare and public health with my math. And I love to do mathematical modeling. And I love to travel. I get to travel with this job. And of course, I get to see lots of interesting architecture in all these different places. And so I like to talk a lot about uh, go to high schools, elementary schools, uh, do public lectures to talk about how math and biology can be combined. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to COVID-19. So the title of this lecture is looking at how, what does math have to do with COVID-19? And so what's really interesting about mathematical modeling in Canada is that this Center for Disease Modeling that I'm a co-director of was uh, initiated really uh, soon after 2003 SARS. Um, and so there's a group of mathematicians in Canada started developing a Center for Disease Modeling uh, in 2009 uh, for H1N1. We were involved in pandemic preparedness um, and we were uh, doing some modeling, of course, for that and looking at stockpiles of antivirals and looking at vaccine demand. But it wasn't until COVID-19 happened, the very beginning, where mathematical modeling, all, through all these pandemics, math modeling has grown in involvement in each one, but it's really been at the forefront of COVID-19 response. Um, and so here are some just news titles that I picked from the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was even big news that uh, a disease modeler in the UK wasn't following the restrictions that he was supposed to be following. And so it's international news. So, um, And then over the pandemic, I've also been involved in lots of interviews with the news uh, and media and with lots of my colleagues also at the Centre for Disease Modeling and across Canada. Um, I also moved to France for a year during the pandemic and was involved in COVID-19 modeling uh, from there as well. So some of the questions that have been asked uh, to me. Uh, so it went from, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a math, I'm a disease modeler, well, what's that? To, I'm a disease modeler, like, oh, you're one of those people? And I get a lot of these questions. Like, what's in a model? What do you do? What do you look for? What data do you use? What mathematical tools do you use? Are models right? And if a model's wrong, what does that mean? Uh, so I, I talk a lot about this, these questions, to students in high schools and in public fora, and even on the bench for my soccer team uh, in, between, in between shifts. And so um, a little bit more about me. Uh, I've always been interested in learning about immunity in a population. And so I focus my mathematical modeling 
um, on questions to do with immunity. And so that means that I need to understand or try, I use mathematical modeling to try to understand how immunity develops in you after vaccination or after an infection and also understand how your immune system helps you um, resist an infection or how your immune system, your initial conditions of your immune system at the time of exposure uh, will help moderate your symptoms as well. And so in, in mathematical immunity, uh, we're interested in developing models of pathogen dynamics and vaccination and pharmaceutical use in the person. So we track cells and vaccine and things like that in, in the immune system. I also, at the population level, try to quantify distributions of immunity in the entire population so that we can determine if a population is, uh, or what quantify the protectedness of the population against a particular pathogen. And so we look at the vaccination program, we look at um, influenza strains that spread from year to year and how they evolve, and same with COVID-19, the different strains that arise and what our effective immunity in the population is against those pathogens to help determine what um, booster programs might be needed or if a new vaccine formulation is needed as well. So I make mathematical models that track pathogen and immune system interactions. I also use these to quantify the severity of symptoms that an ind individual will feel. And, and this helps us also model behavior of individuals during a pandemic on whether individuals will be likely to stay home uh, or from, from work or school um, and how transmissible they will be. We do the same thing for looking at vaccinations and pharmaceuticals. We, we look at how the Im immunity is developed. When we're looking at population spread of, pathogen, of the pathogen, we need to, of course, consider um, social behavior. Um, so are people going by what the, the current rules are? Uh, social distancing, are you wearing masks? Are you going to choose to wear masks even when, mandate, uh, when mandates are lifted? and so on, and, and how, uh, how you are, uh, during the early days of the pandemic, the, the social bubbles, how you were choosing your social bubble uh, and how strict your, your social bubble was. But then in terms of looking at the population distribution of immunity, we also need to, of course, we're interested in following how infectious diseases move around the world. But I said that we're really interested in my lab in following immunity around the world. And so we try to quantify distributions of immunity um, considering immigration and emigration as well, looking at vaccination programs from other countries, uh, what diseases are prevalent in other countries for, from our immigrant populations, so that when we're looking at quantifying immunity in Toronto, we have a different set of conditions compared to trying to quantify this level of immunity in Regina or in Winnipeg, for example. An important thing to also realize about immunity is that your immunity is dynamic and your effective uh, immunity against infection from a pathogen is always changing. And so uh, after you go through your primary infection, you gain some immunity, but as a pathogen evolves, that immunity becomes less effective against the circulating strains. So we try to quantify the decay rate of your effective immunity over time. Uh, also, we try to quantify the decay rate of your immunity from vaccination and from infection because we do know that antibody levels can wane. Uh, and we try to understand how your T cell memory in your body um, is also affected over time as well. And so you can think about your immunity kind of being on this conveyor belt, your effective immunity, so that when you get vaccines or you get infected with a particular strain, you go up in immunity, and then over time your effective immunity can decay. And that, that decay rate could be non-existent for some pathogens uh, and can, can be quite fast for some others, like the common cold, uh, your immunity decays quite quickly, but for measles, it's very, very, very long uh, sustained immunity that you have. So disease modeling has been around for a long time. Um, Bernoulli has been um, documented to have made a mathematical analysis of smallpox vaccination back in the 1700s. 
John Snow used uh, statistical models and center of mass to look at a cholera uh, epidemic in London. Semmelweis used statistics to look at uh, maternity ward infections in Austria. And Ronald Ross won a Nobel Prize for his work on malaria, which involved uh, mathematical modeling for control of malaria, looking at the difference between control of mosquitoes and infectious disease between mosquitoes and humans. It was in the 1920s that Kermack and McKendrick published their seminal mathematical work uh, on the SIR model. Um, and so this model looks at how a susceptible population, S, can become infected. So when a susceptible and an infected meet, so that's multiplication of S times I, then you can get an infected person, and that rate of change or rate of infection is with beta. Um, and then individuals can recover from infection and remove in, uh, and then be uh, moved into the removed class and uh, uh, become resistant to infection. And so all infectious disease models at the population level are based on this SIR model that was published in the 1920s. But I said that I also do a lot of work on in-host infection. And the TIV model for target cell, uh, infected cell, and virus particle, mo um, this model was first developed in the 1990s. And this was when uh, HIV became a really important disease to try to understand. And so uh, at the same time, these two different researchers, Alan Perelson and Martin Novak, both founded the TIV model in the 1990s, and it was highly motivated by trying to understand uh, HIV infection and persistence in individuals. And all disease models and vaccination models and drug therapy models of what's happening with your immune system um, are extensions of this TIV model. And so when we're looking at a population level, our disease models can be very, very, very complex. So we need to consider different stages of infection, whether you're infectious or not, whether you can become chronically infected. Um, we know that different age groups uh, have different outcomes of infection um, and even different uh, susceptibilities to infection. Uh, also, we know that all of our immune systems are different. And so we can take a, math a mathematical like this, where we have vaccination, waning immunity, chronic infection C, we can think about hospitalization and treated treatment compartments that also exist. And then we can put this star here, where star means all of your individual characteristics that are different compared to other people in the population. Uh, in in-host modeling, we know that our, our immune system is also very complex and that TIV model just wraps the entire immune system into parameters. Um, but all of our immune systems are different. And we know that uh, different conditions can affect our, our response to different pathogens and vaccination too. And so we can get very, very complex uh, in-host models too where we follow uh, the, the development of antibodies from B cells and memory T cells, memory CD8 T cells. Uh, over time that uh, give us some protection from uh, new infections, but also protection against severe disease if we do get infected in the future. So when we're looking at the complexity of mathematical models, we also have to consider the types of data and the um, availability of data that we can use to inform our mathematical modeling. So there's always this want to make big models because they reflect the biology better, but if we don't have data to be able to inform the parameters of our mathematical models, then we can really just replicate anything uh, in the population and have no, um, like just, you can replicate anything and not, not be sure if it's true at all. So we always need to be considering statistics as well and power in our data um, and dimensionalization of our models to really understand how much data we need to be able to use a, a model that has a certain level of complexity. And so over COVID-19, of course, I've been tracking uh, or and using data to do with um, incidents of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths uh, by province, by country as well. We have lots of projects on different countries. We've also been using data on vaccination uptake 
uh, by different dose, uh, doses and different vaccines, by age, by, by province, uh, by ethnicity, by gender as well. We've also been looking at how public health mitigation strategies affect your effective number of contacts every day. Uh, and, and that's a, a really important thing because in Canada, public uh, health is provincial. And so every province has different rules. And so if we want to model Ontario, we have to take into consideration um, all the extra school closure that Ontario had, for example, compared to some of the other provinces when we're looking at trying to project what other waves of COVID-19, the, the next wave of COVID-19 looks like um, and try to understand the efficacy of public health mitigation programs on um, uh, saving you from infection uh, as well. And so we have a lot of analysis that we go, that we, that we have done in our lab in trying to understand the levels of school closure uh, by province, uh, work from home and how that has been uh, enforced in different provinces, as well as uh, looking at extracurricular activities, closing of stores and so on, because that's going to affect that contact rate that people have in a population, which of course is going to affect transmission of the infectious disease. Over time, we've also had to incorporate or think about the increased level of fitness of the virus. Uh, so when we looked at the historical strain, like alpha, and then alpha, then delta, then Omicron, every time the virus is more fit or more transmissible and maybe even better at replicating in, in the host. And so we have to also understand that. Um, and then uh, look at the trade-off between the increased level of fitness and replication of the host and look at the public health mitigation strategies and the strict um, level of enforcement that might be needed given that increase in, in, in infectivity. Also, what's important to know is that uh, there are immune escape mechanisms uh, that can be common for particular virus variants. And so when Omicron came in, uh, it had immune escape mechanisms so it could infect people that had high levels of protection against alpha and delta. Um, and so uh, we need to consider that as well in the population and then look at how our, your effective immunity could maybe wane faster against Omicron. Uh, it is a coronavirus, so maybe your immunity might start, your effective immunity against this coronavirus could be quite quick, uh, like a common cold. Uh, for example, as, as we go into the future. Um, when we look at data too, we try to understand how people are moving around during different stages of public health mitigation. So we also have a lot of conject conjecture here. Um, we don't know exactly how people are making their decisions, but we can incorporate game theory and decision making into our mathematical models to see how people might choose social distancing over vaccination or vice versa, and how that changes over time. Finally, when we're looking at data, we also do a lot of modeling of clinical trials and infection in hosts so that we can understand what the outcomes look like for your immune system from mild, moderate, or severe infections by age, as well as looking at the efficacy and the waning rate of your immunity from the different vaccines like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna. And recently, we've also been doing some work on uh, uh, the vaccine coming from the uh, Vito Institute in Saskatchewan, um, looking at uh, animal data and, and how trying to understand how uh, vaccine companies will choose a particular vaccine candidate over others from their animal studies in the lab. So as an infectious disease modeler, uh, when, an individual, when a new pandemic or outbreak has started in a population, all infectious disease modelers around the world race to try to understand or quantify the reproduction number. And so here I am infected with something. Um, and here are some more modelers from the Canadian Centre for Disease Modeling. And you can think that maybe over the course of my whole infection, I had contact with all of these people, but I only infected Dr. Wu, Dr. Jankowski. And so my basic reproduction number then is two. So that means I replaced myself and I'm one person with two people. And so that means that the infection will grow in the population. And so we look at all the different P 
people who are infected and see on average how many people are those people replacing themselves with. And if on average that number is greater than one, then the, the disease will increase in the population. If on average it's less than one, the disease will die out. And if it's equal to one, then the disease will persist. And so that's a threshold condition in, um, uh, in mathematical bifurcation analysis uh, that, that we're always considering to see uh, whether a, an infectious disease will increase or decay in a population. And then when we look at the parameters that are involved from our mathematical models in calculating the basic reproduction number, then we can try to see which public health mitigation programs or vaccination or the use of drug therapy in infecteds are going to modify parameters enough so that the reproduction number can be less than one. So also at the beginning of a pandemic, we, we try to use some like um, boutique models to try to understand how social distancing and mitigation programming uh, will, will help us out in flattening the curve. I don't know if you remember the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about flattening the curve. And so here's just a small simulation that I wrote where we have individuals in a population and this is um, parameterized for COVID-19 at the beginning of the pandemic um, given uh, the average number of contacts that you have pre-COVID on, um, on an average day. And so you can see that when we seed the infection, so green is susceptible and the black lines are, are connections of your friends and family and red are infecteds and then invisible are, are all our recovered individuals. So we see the infection, you can see how COVID-19 sweeps through the population. In the middle simulation, what we've done is we've cut the number of contacts that you have on average in half. And so you can see that the infectious disease goes through this population. Um, it will, but over a much longer period of time. And that's really where that flattening of the curve comes from. You, you restrict your number of contacts each day so that we can really flatten that and make it extend out longer so that our healthcare system can manage all the caseload. On the right, what we've done is we've maintained the number of connections on average that you have each day, but we've made the connections more cliquey. So it's more like the social bubbles that we had during the beginning of the pandemic as well. And you can see how having a high number of connections in cliqueyness and social bubbles can still have uh, some sweeping through of the pandemic, but it affects less people than when we don't have that cliquiness at all. At the beginning of a pandemic, we also try to consider, consider well, what if there's a vaccine, there will eventually be a vaccine. Uh, what effect is that going to have in the population? And you can see, so we have a population of people who are susceptible, exposed means infected, but not infectious yet. Yellow is infectious and uh, we have red in our, our recovered. And when we give our vaccine to people, that means that we give them some, um, some protection against infection. And so effectively you can see that there's this, long, this longer distance between individuals. And so when you vaccinate some people, you, you restrict that chain, that chain of infection. And so you're effectively increasing that distance between individuals, even though physically you're, you're not changing it. Um, so over the pandemic, I was also uh, uh, involved in a contract with Health Canada, where we looked at um, taking forecasts of um, uh, COVID-19 over the next month or two, and then we would translate that into trying to understand what the demand would be for ICU and ward beds in different jurisdictions in Canada. And then we would provide a report, a weekly report to Health Canada that was then in, incorporated into a larger report that would go to the health minister uh, and to the prime minister and to uh, Theresa Tam to look at, uh, to inform the provinces as to what we were seeing in our modeling so that they could get ready for the next wave of infection or um, take uh, earlier steps to manage social, social distancing, mask wearing and vaccination campaigns so that over or excess demand of the healthcare system uh, wouldn't have to occur. Um, so this is a mathematical model that we use to model AstraZeneca. 
um, as well as Pfizer and Moderna to understand the outcomes of uh, vaccination in individuals and look at waning immunity. But we also uh, made in-host models to look at outcomes of mild, moderate, and severe infection in individuals as well. And what we found when we're looking at AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna, and from infection, is that immunity can wane from any of these. Um, we, though, were able to see that, um, or we were able to quantify the persistence of antibodies uh, in, in the host over time. We are also able to see that uh, immunity wanes faster in individuals that are older. Uh, we are also able to see that there wasn't a huge difference between uh, immunity decay rates between males and females. Uh, we did see that in mild infections, you would get a, a lower level of immunity compared to someone who had a moderate infection or someone who had a severe infection. We also could see that uh, someone who had a mild infection was infected for a shorter period of time than someone who had a moderate infection or a severe infection. We tried to quantify all of these things uh, and try to understand all of these things in hosts so that then when we're looking at population level models of spread of these infectious diseases, then we could consider all of these effects so that we could uh, really try to understand to how truly strict does a public health mitigation program really need to be to protect the population. One thing that we did see um, in our models is that when we looked at how age groups have contact with each other um, at school, work, um, at home, and other, other areas or social, social places, um, we did see that no matter what public health mitigation program we were implementing uh, by province, and not we meaning me, but Canada and, and, and other countries, that when we looked at the Canadian data, uh, 15 to 19 year olds always had the higher number of contacts on average every day. And that makes sense. Even when schools were closed, uh, people were working in the service industry. Uh, the students were also still meeting each other at parks and things like that, uh, so that's, fi that's fine. But we could totally see that when we were looking at where should we be rolling out the vaccination program, um, we, firstly, we saw with our mathematical modeling that yes, we should start with the elderly and with healthcare workers and people who had to go to work during the pandemic. But we also saw that because of this high level of contacts, that as, as early as we could, if we can vaccinate this age group, it will have a positive indirect effect on all other age groups in the population. And so, and we published this um, last year. Uh, and it was especially important because vaccinating these 15 to 19 year olds um, also really positively affected the outcomes of infection um, or the, the, de the decrease in transmission in the elderly and in the very young age groups that couldn't get vaccinated. So here is an example of one of our mathematical model outputs. And here we're fitting our mathematical model to um, case report data incidents. So we take the total number of cases that are reported every day and we fit a mathematical model to it that we're here. This is our daily incidence of our severe infections and the dash dot line is our daily inc incidence of moderate infections and then our mild infections. I'm not even plotting here because it's just so big. Um, and so what we do is we fit our mathematical model to the data and then we're able to uh, use our mathematical model that incorporates different age groups and immunity distributions over age to see where do we need boosts in immunity and who is going to be infected in the next wave of infection. And so last year in August 2021, uh, we were asked to use our mathematical model to look at questions like that. And so we fit our model to data up until mid-August. Uh, and then we looked at the outcomes of the model in distributions of immunity and infection. And I'm not going to go through what all of these colors mean. Uh, but at the top, we can just see that there are some light shades of red here. Those are totally susceptible individuals in the youngest age groups. And so we are able to see, we were able to say to Ontario that we need more 12 to 29 year olds to be vaccinated. And uh, tw at that time, 12 plus was allowed to be vaccinated. So we're like, 
you should think about changing your vaccination campaign um, so that we really target that age group so that we can get more people to go get vaccine to protect the population. We could also see this increase here in blue and in yellow. The blue is giving us an in indication of the number of mild infections that are asymptomatic. Um, yellow is moderate infections that won't need health care, but that will be reported. Um, and so we were able to say that most of the infections that are going to happen in the fall 2021 wave that we project uh, are going to be mild and moderate. But in green here, that's where we have our severe infections. And you can see that it's decaying. But it's not decaying because we don't have severe infections. It's decaying because it's also giving us an idea of our distribution of immunity. And so people are decaying out of that very highly protected level of immunity at the same time as other people are being infected and coming in. And so we have more people leaving that class than coming in. So we, didn't, we don't have a lot of infections happening that are going to be severe. But then when we did look at the severe infections over on the right, we're able to see that 50% of all severe infections happening in fall 2021 were going to be in individuals that were age 50 plus. And so we recommended to the Ontario Science Table at the time that a third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine be open up to all individuals age 50 plus as early as the beginning of September. When we looked at also where severe infections came from, we could see in that fall wave that most severe infections were going to come from people in the red shades uh, who were unvaccinated and who were older. So the darker the red, the older the cohort. And only a few people that would be infected uh, in the fall would have uh, had previous vaccination. And that is something that we projected, and it's actually in line with what was experienced in that fall wave as well. When we looked at projections too, using a lot simpler models, we looked at relaxation. So people were becoming tired of public health mitigation, social distancing and wearing masks. So we had lots of scenarios that we were looking at in terms of um, decay in vaccine uptake, um, looking at uh, in increased relaxation of our social behavior. And so we looked at a whole bunch of different scenarios with our models. And then we also fit this to data. And we were able to see that one of the, this scenario on the top right best fit um, the data and would be what we were going to call our projection for the fall of 2021. And uh, you could see here that that wave in the fall was quite small for our projection. Uh, but then what we did is we took all of these different scenarios, and especially this one here, where you can see this huge wave of infection to happen in the fall, and we put this through our hospital demand model to see if our hospital system, in our healthcare system in Ontario, would be able to take the demand from this worst case scenario. Uh, and we found that it, our ICUs wouldn't have enough beds. Um, but we did for this scenario where we had availability in the hospitals because um, uh, the healthcare system closed down a lot of elective surgeries and so on, that if the hospital system that was maintained at that level of um, availability, that all the people who couldn't get an ICU bed were always able to get a ward bed. And, and so that was good. And we, we shared this information. Uh, with Health Canada and with the province of Ontario as well to help inform what their fall 2021 should look like. Um, so that's uh, an overview of some things that I, that I looked at in COVID-19 and I'm still looking at. Uh, we're certainly interested in looking at the fall of 2020. Um, we're interested in looking at what a wave of COVID-19 infection will look like with the influenza season that we're certainly going to have now that everybody is back to work and in school and, and moving around almost to pre-COVID levels, uh, as well as that nasty cold that's going around that people are uh, confusing with COVID, uh, or maybe it is COVID and people think it's the cold. Anyway, uh, the, the message is stay home if you're sick. <laughs> uh, but we also do in, in my lab, while we've been mainly focused on COVID-19 in the past three years, um, we, have also, we also do a lot of uh, modeling of other infectious diseases like influenza, HIV, tuberculosis, measles, pertussis, 
uh, HPV, hum uh, herpes simplex virus, malaria, and hepatitis C and B. And these are all in-host level modeling to understand um, looking at the efficacies of drug therapy in some of these individuals, but then for childhood diseases, looking at um, if we need to change the vaccination program, like for our, our childhood vaccination program, say for pertussis, um, when we see some increases in, uh, in pertussis infection in the population. Uh, also, in public health, we look at vaccination and booster dose programs. Uh, we're also working with some companies in the pharmaceutical industry uh, to quantify the efficacy of some of their vaccines uh, in humans in clinical trials and in animals and at the bench level as well. Um, look at social and physical distancing, work from home, closing schools, limiting extracurriculars, trying to quantify the effectiveness of those uh, public health mitigation programs uh, over the pandemic. Uh, we work with lots of people in government, the pharmaceutical industry, educators, researchers, uh, in, in lots of different fields. And, and we're funded by a lot of different funding agencies and government and the pharmaceutical interest industry. So disease, disease modeling uh, has been a very fruitful um, field for me. It's very interesting. It's very fun. And I really do thank Trent for giving me the education uh, to be able to move forward into this field that I'm so passionate about. Um, and at that, I'd like to thank Trent and David and the mathematics department for all of your support and my family as well. My husband and kids and my parents are, are here to share in this, this uh, event with me. And I also want to thank my research group. Uh, you can see that I have lots of collaborators uh, lots of individuals in my research group. I'm also uh, leading the in-host modeling uh, national network uh, and in the Center for Disease Modeling. You can see individuals from different countries here that, uh, that are close collaborators. Uh, so all this work is really involving a lot of different people. And so uh, I'll thank them as well and acknowledge them for all of their work too. Thank you. Sure.